Thank you for being here. It's now my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce um, my good friend, Dawood Bey. Um, I always give pretty ugly introductions, so I'm going to read this. Um, Dawood Bey is considered one of the great artists of our time. And if you did not pick up the New York Times today, they will let you know as much. Um, his work delves deeply into black subjectivity, from the candid street photographs of Harlem in the 1970s to his psychologically probing portraits of teenagers. Since his first exhibition at the Studio Museum in Harlem, his work has been celebrated with exhibitions too numerous to name, um, but they have been presented from coast to coast and around the globe. In 2020, his work was the subject of a 40-year retrospective mounted by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art along with the Whitney Museum of American Art. And that exhibition traveled extensively across the United States. In 2022, the Grand Rapids Museum of Art organized the two-person exhibition, Dawood Bay and Carrie Mae Weems in Dialogue, which traveled to Los Angeles and the Getty Museum. Bay's work has been the subject of also numerous publications, including class pictures um, produced by Aperture in 2007, Harlem, USA, produced by Yale, Picturing People, Renaissance Society and the University of Chicago in 2012, uh, Dawood Bay, The Birmingham Project in 2013, Seeing Deeply, produced by the University of Texas at Austin, my former alma mater, and uh, in 2018, and the monograph Dawood Bay, Two American Projects, um, which was the title of the exhibition, The 40-Year Retrospective. Dawood Bay Elegy, our book here. <laughs> Dawood Bay Elegy now joins that esteemed list of publications. It was produced in a partnership with the Aperture Foundation. Um, Dawood is a native of Jamaica, Queens, New York, and received his BFA from the Empire State College, which is now part of SUNY, as well as an MFA from Yale University. Among his major awards and accolades is the 2017 MacArthur Foundation Genius Award Fellowship. <laughs> as well as awards from the John Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. He is the recipient of numerous honorary doctorate degrees, including from his own alma mater in New York City, um, the Center for Creative Studies in Detroit, and the MICA, the Maryland Institute for Arts, uh, among them. Uh, this year, he was honored as part of the Aperture Foundation. Dawood is a distinguished professor emeritus at Columbia College in Chicago, and where I met him, and that was nearly three decades ago. And so uh, the trust that you have instilled in me uh, in mounting this exhibition and working together has been profoundly, um, profoundly deeply um, an honor for me. I don't, I get tongue tied, sorry. So please help me welcome to the stage and in conversation, um, the Dr. Reverend Dawood Bey. What an honor, Dawood. What an honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And good afternoon, certainly, to, uh, to all of you. Uh, the light is shining in my eyes, so I, I can't see all of you, but thank all of you. Thank you for uh, the friends who traveled from near and far and those who have come from near, I guess. Yeah, you know, closer. I'm glad to be sitting here with all of you this afternoon. And obviously, very glad to be sitting here with uh, Valerie Cassell Oliver, uh, who, as she just said, I've, I've known for many years. I, I mark time by the age of my son, who is now 32. <laughs> and, and Valerie knew him when he was a baby. 
so that's how long we've both known each other and how long we've had a conversation. Yes, yes. You know, because I uh, always tell people that the work that happens between artists and curators is uh, one that happens uh, out of a conversation. You know, the work, the exhibitions, the publication, they come out of a conversation, a conversation about ideas, a conversation around common interests, a conversation, in a case like this, around what if. Yes. What if. What if. So thank you profoundly. And uh, before we start, I also want to give uh, an enthusiastic and warm uh, thanks of gratitude uh, to the institution, to uh, Alex Neogis, uh, the director here, mm -hmm. who warmly and enthusiastically embraced the idea of this project uh, from the moment uh, Valerie and I started talking about it. Obviously, he and Valerie had probably talked about it before Valerie and I talked well, about it. Well, I, I don't know. Well, we did because, you know, I, and I have Frank Davenport's photograph on the screen now. Everyone seems to understand your work in relation to the black subject within the frame. Um, and often the candid shots of Harlem, whether it was in 1970s or Harlem Redux where you went back in uh, the 2010s. But history and landscape has been a part of your DNA for a long time. Uh, I think it gets exemplified in the trilogy um, that becomes Elegy. But the beginning, visual beginning of your histories began with the Birmingham Project, which mm -hmm. is set off by this Davenport photograph. Do you want to, I mean, you talk about this as being a catalyst for you, this one image of Sarah uh, in her hospital bed uh, being a catalyst. Um, yeah, it was a very uh, important and entirely unexpected moment when this young girl that you see in the photograph, uh, Sarah Jean Collins, who was uh, the sister of Addie Mae Collins, who was one of the four girls who were killed in the, dynamite, the dynamiting of the 16th Street Baptist Church. And I first saw this picture uh, when I was 11 years old mm -hmm. in a book called The Movement. Uh, a book of photographs of and about the civil rights movement uh, that was published by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, who had then uh, gathered the photographs and commissioned Lorraine Hansberry, the writer and playwright, to uh, write a text that would weave these photographs together. Uh, my mother and father went to hear James Baldwin speak at our church, and after Baldwin's talk, they were selling this book uh, the movement. Uh, Baldwin's talk may very well have been part of a book tour. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. But they bought the book and they brought it home. And they didn't make uh, a big fuss about the book. They didn't put it in my hand and say, you have to look at this. This is important. They, they just left it where I could find it because uh, I was an inveterate reader. I read everything from the cereal box to whatever. So they knew my curiosity would lead me to this book, mm -hmm. uh, which it did. And of all the horrific photographs in the book, including lynching photographs, this photograph of this girl laying wounded in a hospital bed just seared its way into my psyche. Uh, I, I never forgot it. Mm -hmm. I carried this photograph around in my head for decades, uh, when one morning, inexplicably, I wish I knew what shook it loose, mm. but that's exactly what happened early one morning. I sat bolt upright in bed, uh, which I used to think was an expression, but it's not just an expression. It's a, real, it's a real thing. <laughs> and it was as if someone had smacked me on the back of the head, and I sat up. Mm. And the image 
that flashed vividly in my mind was this image. Mm -hmm. This girl came back to me. Mm -hmm. I guess she was calling me. She was calling me back to the history. Mm -hmm. uh, and so without uh, ever having been to Birmingham before, I took that uh, as a sign because it was so vivid and so strong. I took it as a sign that even as I was in the midst of another project, I needed to go to Birmingham. I needed to figure out how to make something of this traumatic history that had never left me. Uh, I went back and forth to Birmingham, uh, I think a friend said, uh, for at least seven years, yeah. because I was in the midst of other work, but I went first uh, to go to 16th Street Baptist Church, you know, because I needed to see the site, the place where this had happened. Uh, and then through friends that I met in Birmingham, through the Birmingham Museum of Art, even before they had committed to doing a project or an exhibition, I started to become introduced to people in Birmingham who had been a part of the history that I wanted to make work about. Uh, probably most notably on the very first uh, day that I was there, or the Monday after, I had lunch with Odessa Wolkfolk, mm. uh, a civil rights movement icon who is the founding director of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. And over the years in those periodic trips, I began to build a community in Birmingham, really. Indeed. And but also, over those years, I'm trying to think, what kind of work do I make of this? What work could I possibly make that was equal to the trauma and the significance of this horrific moment? Right, but it was also a study in time and a study about how do you talk about the past and make it relevant to our contemporary times. Yeah. So I love this project, the portfolio that you created around this very iconic moment. Yeah, the, the Birmingham project was the first time that I began to think specifically about history. Although, to be honest, uh, my first project, Column USA, was rooted in the fact that my mother and father had met and lived in that community. Right. So I think history has kind of been the background for my work. With this work, it comes to the fore. Right. It's the thing that I want to make work about. Uh, and eventually, from doing research at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, uh, I found out that not only the four girls had been killed that day, but two boys mm -hmm. had been killed in racist incidents immediately following the dynamiting of the church, uh, who are not often talked about. Uh, within that history, and so I knew that I had to embrace them in whatever the conceptual shape of the project was going to be. And eventually, in what became a real conceptual breakthrough uh, for me, I decided to photograph not only young people who were the ages of these six young people who had been killed that day, because my initial idea was to make those kind of mythic presences mm. tangible and palpable, mm -hmm. but I decided that wasn't enough, and I decided to also photograph adults, also from and in Birmingham, who were the exact same ages that those young people would have been they had they not been murdered which also meant, of course, that they were the age of those young people who were murdered in 1963. Right. So they were very much a part of that history. And to take those two portraits mm -hmm. and put them together in the form of a diptych, which also kind of simultaneously collapsed and expanded the sense of time. Right. You know, uh, it was the first time that I created what you might call this liminal space that was both past and present. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time. Uh, and so that work was shown uh, at the Birmingham Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. uh, 
for the first time in September of 2003, exactly 50 years to the date of the dynamiting of the church. Uh, the institutional piece of this conversation then, and even going back to showing my Harlem USA work at Studio Museum and showing the work that's being shown here and was commissioned here uh, from the, uh, the Richmond Slave Trail or the Trail of uh, the Enslaved. Uh, the work is also, as much as it is the making of the work, a way of working institutionally yeah. to bring the work into being and to take the world outside of the museum and to somehow bring it inside of the institutional space. Now, I know that's a long answer, but <laughs> Well, yeah. no, it, it sets it up perfectly because it, I think the important thing also is to denote that there isn't a desire to restage um, an event it's always conceptually about evoking a moment in history for people to push further, uh, but then also to make that history all of, always relevant to our everyday. Yeah, yeah and to bring, to bring that historical conversation into not only the shape of my work, mm -hmm. but into the institutional space, to make the museum as an institutional space a place where those kinds of conversations can be provoked through the making of certain kinds of art objects. Yeah. And that's very much uh, an important piece of my practice as well, mm -hmm. engaging with the institutional space and trying to uh, expand the possibilities of what might happen there. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm letting everyone read something quite profound. Dawood is an amazing photographer, but an even amazing writer and Why thinker. So <laughs> um, oftentimes the work um, is really the result of a very insightful um, uh, renderings around history and conversations around history itself. Um, but as we were saying earlier, as I was saying earlier about you know, landscape being a part of the DNA. It was um, something that oftentimes people focused on the black subject matter in the work, but almost extracting it from its environment, the, the, the image from its environment. But landscape is, uh, is a hallmark, of course, of photography. And it's something that, of course, you are deeply influenced by as well. So can you talk about some of the uh, influences uh, from the kind of photographic history standpoint that, um, that really helps you shape uh, the series that are now on view, will now be on view? Yeah, I think um, for the larger part of my uh, career, uh, my subject has been framed within what is usually called the portrait the representation of the human subject, the representation of the black subject, but the space and place that those subjects inhabit mm -hmm. has always been very much a part of the meaning and the narrative of the work. So place has always been important to my work. And um, after the Birmingham project, I wanted to continue uh, working with this idea of uh, conflating the past and the present. And the portrait no longer seemed like the uh, appropriate or resonant conceptual container mm -hmm. for the work. It made very good sense with the Birmingham Project mm -hmm. because it was about the lives of individuals that I wanted to invoke and bring into the shape of the work. But with uh, the work that I went on to do after the Birmingham project, uh, it is situated very much within uh, what one would refer to as the landscape tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, with an American photography begins, as you see oh, in the I'll first slide, with the 19th century mm -hmm. landscape photographs. Uh, those photographs are kind of foundational 
to the representation of the American landscape in photographic form. And of course, those, those photographs uh, were, as all photographs are, and all landscape photographs are, highly subjective mm -hmm. because they represented an unpopulated American landscape, which was, of course, in fact, populated. Mm -hmm. And the photographs became the visual blueprint for what became the this idea of manifest, manifest destiny. destiny exactly. uh, yeah. So the landscape has always been a very subjective space. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm uh, deeply engaged in the history of photography and the works that I have uh, continued to think about as I've continued making my work of those landscapes from the American West, mm -hmm. uh, Lee Freelander's mm -hmm. photograph, mm -hmm. um, monuments in the American landscape, mm -hmm. the way the history is visualized through monuments. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, Frank Golke, mm -hmm. uh, another important American landscape photographer. Uh, and, and in this project from Wichita, Kansas, it, it again, mm -hmm. collapses past and present. Mm -hmm. Uh, in these photographs of a tornado at the moment of, in the immediate aftermath, mm -hmm. and then returning to that site. Um, Golke, not incidentally, was one of my uh, grad school advisors. Mm -hmm. so I've, I've had a lot of conversations with Golke, and also with uh, Joel Sternfeld, yes. who was my second uh, advisor in grad school. And of course, ironically, um, while I was in conversation with both of them, I was making my street portraits. I was making portraits. Uh, I knew their work. I admired their work. Um, I talked with them about their work. They talked about my portraits. Mm -hmm. And I never at that moment had, had given any thought to the fact that I might end up Being. making work within that uh, kind of genre space of the landscape. But as I've continued making this work, I've also been uh, very mindful of the absence of a significant black presence within this tradition and history of uh, American landscape photography. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I intend for the projects that I've been doing for the last several years is to situate that work within the landscape tradition and bring a sense of the unseen but very present black presence uh, within the landscape. But I see that work as being in conversation with, as I always see my work being in conversation with, the broader history. Exactly. You know? And Joel is very interesting because the sites that he photographs really have these embedded histories in geography, which uh, beautifully feeds into the trilogy. Yeah, I don't know if any of you know Joel's project uh, on this site, but these are photographs where traumatic incidents have occurred. They're not visible in the photograph, but the places hold these memories. Exactly. Uh, the photograph on the left is in Central Park, and there was a case, some of you of a certain age might know, came to be known as the Preppy Murder Case, mm. where this preppy Robert Chambers raped and murdered uh, a woman, Jennifer Levin, right at that site. Uh, and the other is uh, in Forest Hills. Uh, it, it was a moment that kind of shifted the social landscape. There was a woman, Kitty Genovese, Mm. and Flushing, who uh, she was being attacked in the streets. No Hundreds of people heard. Yeah. They pulled their shades down. Yeah. They didn't want to get involved. Mm. You know, no one came out to help her. Mm -hmm. You know, which at that moment was a kind of... Revelation about... It was a revelation yes. about the social character yes. of, uh, you know, who we're living with, mm. you know. So these photographs, uh, certainly Joel's photograph, but all of these landscape photographs have history embedded in them that might not be visible in the photograph, but the meaning of the photographs are, in fact, 
the history that those landscapes hold. Right. So the work that I've been doing uh, since the Birmingham Project and starting with uh, yeah. Life Coming Tenderly Black, mm -hmm. uh, which is about uh, the path of fugitivity mm -hmm. uh, in the Northeastern uh, Ohio landscape for those fugitive uh, African-Americans moving through that landscape uh, on the way to Lake Erie and then Canada. Because Northeastern Ohio is very proximate to Lake Erie. And then on the other side of Lake Erie lies Canada and presumed freedom. Presumed freedom. So can you talk about the moment? Because when you were asked to come to Cleveland to do this work, um, which was really sunny, it was part of a triennial. Um, how did you determine this particular, uh, because this begins our conversation about what is now Elegy. Uh, what really drew you to that particular space uh, when you were driving around and the idea around uh, fugitivity and these histories holding? Yeah, the um, night coming tenderly black work you know, after Birmingham, I knew I wanted to continue working with history. And it happened that uh, Fred Bidwell, mm -hmm. uh, who had an institution in a space called the Transformer Station in Cleveland, uh, Fred approached me and asked me if I'd be interested in making work in Cleveland, uh, in Ohio. And once I'm in the midst of an idea, I don't want to do anything to disrupt that. Mm. So I told him I would be interested in making work in Cleveland if I could do some research and see if there was some significant piece of uh, African-American history that unfolded in that region. So we're just going to cycle through these images. Yeah. So and my research know. quickly revealed that Cleveland and Northeastern Ohio mm -hmm. was uh, very central and instrumental as a piece of, or site of, uh, what came to be called the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. And once I knew that that history was there, then I began to uh, take on the project of making work there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's yeah. something also very interesting in the way that you're photographing, because even though the black subject disappears in terms of the figure from the lens, it is also, the presence is still deeply felt through your particular way of, of seeing the landscape. Yeah, the, both the presence in the landscape and the presence through vantage point because with Night Coming Tenderly Black and pretty much all of the uh, history-based work, I'm making this work from a very human eye-level vantage point. Certainly with Night Coming Tenderly Black, uh, that work was about seeing the landscape as if through the eyes of, you know, fugitive African Americans moving through that landscape mm -hmm. and what that might have looked like under the safe cover of darkness. Uh, the work is very materially engaged, materially engaged too, because I was not photographing at nighttime. Mm -hmm. uh, the photographs are printed to have the appearance of nighttime. And the printing of the work is very much informed and inspired by and in conversation with the great mm -hmm. photographer Roy D. Carava, mm -hmm. who I hope some of you know. Mm -hmm. Because if you talk about the black subject, uh, a dark print and a black narrative, you basically describe the foundation of uh, D. Carava's work. Uh, D. Carava was one of my earliest influences from the moment I became uh, interested in photography through his collaboration with Langston Hughes, mm -hmm. a book called The Street Fly Paper of Life. Mm -hmm. And so as much as this work 
uh, Night Coming Tenderly Black is about the narrative of fugitivity. It's also about my conversation, the conversation that I was finally able to have materially with Roy de mm -hmm. now that I had been doing this long enough. You felt ready. To be able to execute <laughs> at that level. Oh, they're uh, stunning. And it's also about the scale of the photographs which much shift so. uh, dramatically. With yeah, these. to make an object, you know, a photographic object that goes from being the experience of an object uh, a consciousness that you're looking at a photograph and through the scale to become more of a, an experience, yeah. to move from an object-based kind of experience to one that is more kind of immersive and you know, experiential. If you stand close enough to the photograph within your field of vision, there's nothing else to see but that space. So I've, I've used scale. Uh, very intentionally, too. Both to bring back some of the physicality of the landscape itself, but to create a, a sense through the scale of the environment, the physical environment, uh, as it exists on the wall, to try to, to try to figure out how to push past a you know, wall-based object to something more uh, experiential. And the other uh, piece of uh, the work uh, beginning uh, with Night Coming Tenderly Black has to do with this ongoing conversation with black expressive culture yeah. that I've always considered my work to be a part of. So Night Coming Tenderly Black uh, comes from the final line of a poem by Ma Langston Hughes, Dream Variations. Mm -hmm. And that last line is Night Coming Tenderly right. black, black Like Me. And that became a kind of expressive uh, and conceptual hook, too. Mm -hmm. Night coming tenderly, black like me. Mm -hmm. Not night coming intimidatingly, right. black. No, this, this idea that, night, that the darkness of night could be tender. Yes. And that could be a kind of ten, tender embrace through which this act of fugitivity uh, could purpose. take place. Yes. So both Roy Dick Arrival and Langston Hughes are very central to uh, the conceptual shaping of that work. And so this is where we enter the conversation about Stony the Road, because I had heard Dawood speak about Night Coming Tenderly Black in Chicago at the Art Institute, where he also um, organized a small exhibition of, of works by uh, photographers, earlier photographers. <clears throat> But it was very interesting because you were already in New Orleans, you were already in Louisiana, you were already working in New Orleans. So how did that, I mean, I thought, well, fugitivity, of course, you know, this idea of, um, you know, fleeing enslavement toward freedom and, and self-determination, uh, whereas I had just moved to Richmond and had myself been introduced to the historic slave trail. So I thought immediately this was our opportunity to work together because we had this bookend, the beginning of the bondage and of course uh, the rendering, the, the, the self-determination mm -hmm. to flee bondage. But you were already involved in uh, Louisiana. So can you talk in about- Louisiana. Yes, yeah. in this here place. So after um, Night Come and Tenderly Black, which was about uh, fugitivity, uh, the question arises of fugitivity from what? From enslavement. And the place of enslavement, of course, came to be centered on plantations. And I've been spending uh, a lot of time in New Orleans. You know, New Orleans was my kind of escape place. You know, when I got too busy, I would just disappear. <laughs> and, you know, Brian knows I, I would just show up in New Orleans. Uh, so that became my place, but I also became very uh, interested in the history related to that place, and, uh, and particularly the, the continued history of the institution of slavery and enslavement relative to that place. And uh, there are still uh, several uh, relatively and very intact plantation 
landscapes in Louisiana with the most intact uh, of all of them uh, being evergreen, mm -hmm. uh, which is the largest uh, undisturbed plantation landscape in the country with the cabins, 22 cabins that sit exactly where they always have since the 1700s, the big house. It is a very, uh, because it is such an intact landscape, it's also for me a very sacred landscape. Yes. And when you're there, uh, you, you feel the presences of that history. I think you, know, you, you visited recently. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I began to, after night coming tenderly black, uh, want to begin to trace my way deeper into this history. And as I was working on Night Coming Tenderly Black, uh, Naima Keith, uh, who was co-curating with uh, Diane Nari, uh, Prospect 5, mm -hmm. the following year, uh, I kept uh, bumping into Naima uh, as I was sitting on <laughs> Carondelet sipping my chai mm -hmm. in front of Ace Hotel. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Naima was standing there and she would ask me, what, what, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here, I'm working. Mm -hmm. And I'm out in Edgar mm -hmm. uh, doing some work. And she said, oh, very interesting. Uh, and then maybe about after the third time I bumped into her in uh, New Orleans, Mm -hmm. She said, um, well, you know, uh, I'm curating uh, Prospect 5. But of course I knew. Of course. Of course I knew she was curating <laughs> Prospect 5. Very uh, strategic. <laughs> and it was yesterday we said tomorrow, which had everything to do with, yes. uh, you know, the ideas and place that I was working with. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not for me to invite myself into someone's house. But... Uh, but it would be he, standing he, he, outside the door. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think around the third or fourth time uh, Naima <laughs> encountered me on Carondelet, she said, you know I'm working on something. <laughs> and I said, Naima, of course I know you're working on something. I've already begun, I, I, I've been working on this for a while. And she said, well, maybe we can do that. So I think what being invited to participate mm -hmm. in Prospect 5 did, which is always a useful thing, it gave me a deadline. Yeah. Because at that point, I was just there working for myself. Mm -hmm. But now that I know she wants to include it in Prospect 5, because I'm not only making these photographs, I know that when I finish photographing, I want to do a film work. And now all of this has to uh, take place yeah. within a particular uh, time frame. I had just started working uh, with Sean Kelly Gallery, and we were trying to figure out what our first show might be. Uh, and so, of course, it became that work. So now I had uh, two deadlines to give this work some urgency. Mm -hmm. uh, so I continued uh, working on that work, which was presented almost simultaneously. It was presented for the first time uh, at Prospect uh, and then uh, in New York. And of course, relative to this idea of the relationship of presentation to exhibition site, it was, it was important to me that this work made in Louisiana first be seen in Louisiana mm -hmm. within approximate distance of the history that I was making work about, yeah. to bring that work into uh, what ended up becoming uh, the historical New Orleans collection site. Uh, it was a site of history, mm -hmm. and that's where that work uh, debuted uh, in Prospect. So you, you, you gave a shout out to Braun, who's here as a cinematographer. Uh, and I want to talk, just deviate just a minute. Um, in This Here Place did feature the film Evergreen. It wasn't the first film you did. You started with Birmingham with uh, extending uh, yeah, there toward was, the movie. There was one that I did in conjunction with a project uh, at the Detroit Institute of Art, which hasn't been seen much outside of that show called Four Stories mm. that accompanied the class pictures work. Mm -hmm. And it was a short uh, film work about uh, 
four of the young high schoolers that I had worked with uh, photographing and doing text-based work with that project. And then the second one, uh, in conjunction with the Birmingham work, was another film, uh, split image, diptych uh, film, called 91563, uh, which was shown also in conjunction uh, with the Birmingham diptych photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I had uh, probably ever since grad school been a kind of closet filmmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, reluctant to fully embrace it as part of my practice. Uh, I took uh, classes for the two years of grad school with a great filmmaker by the name of Michael Roma, mm -hmm. uh, who did a film called Nothing But a Man with uh, Ivan Dixon and uh, Abby Lincoln. Uh, so I worked for two years uh, making uh, work. It, it was a great, rigorous 10-minute piece every week. Every Monday, you had to show a new, you had to shoot, edit, and present a 10-minute piece around a particular theme. So I've been making uh, films kind of quietly since then. And then when I uh, completed the, uh, the Birmingham photograph, and I'd come in tenderly uh, lack, uh, came. I wasn't able to make a film with that when I wanted to, but it didn't happen, the, uh, the fugitivity photographs. I wasn't able to uh, produce a film for that one. But within this here place, uh, I had met the cinematographer who's sitting right here in the front row, uh, Brian Moye, mm -hmm. uh, who had been hired to uh, do a short piece on me when I won the ICP Infinity Award. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when I met Brian. I was working in New Orleans in, in Louisiana at the time. Uh, Brian was based in uh, Louisiana at the time. So they had him uh, do the short film for me that was going to be presented before the presentation of the uh, award. And when I saw that short film, I knew I wanted to work with this guy. <laughs> I knew I wanted to keep working with him. Well, and so uh, we worked together yeah. on the three-channel uh, video mm -hmm. uh, that became known as Evergreen, which was shot on the uh, site of the Evergreen Plantation. And then uh, Ron was again uh, my cinematographer this time with the support of uh, Jordan Roderick and the team here in uh, Richmond uh, at Span TV, right. uh, which was a great experience. Mm -hmm. uh, having the level of expertise of the Span TV crew and then uh, the expertise of In Your Ear mm -hmm. with one of the great sound engineers, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Bruski. Uh, so, yeah, you all will get to see this new two-channel film, uh, 350,000. Mm -hmm. uh, the soundtrack for 350,000 was made in conjunction with a wonderful uh, dancer and choreographer, also from right here in Richmond, uh, who Valerie introduced me to. Gaynell Sherrod, who might also be sitting out here yep. in the somewhere dark there. Oh, right somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so yeah. I wanted to talk about how the film really extends what you're doing in terms of the photographs, because it's bringing in, beyond just the physicality, a whole kind of psychic space uh, into, into the galleries. Yeah, and that's something that I've uh, both explored and wanted to uh, explore. The uh, Birmingham piece, 9-15-63, uh, my son Ramon was still making music at the time. So he composed a beautiful ambient sound soundtrack uh, for, my, uh, for the first film work, the mm -hmm. uh, first collaboration with my son. Uh, but film, the moving image, both obviously and in very complex ways, 
that's something that the still image doesn't. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one of those things is to allow for uh, a sonic dimension mm -hmm. that can make the moving image resonate even more deeply and give it more of a layered context mm -hmm. and uh, to amplify and bring to life the imagined uh, sound of history, mm -hmm. even though it's imagined right. and it is something that is not meant to be a kind of literal soundtrack in a movie way, mm -hmm. but to bring the moving image and the sonic into a conversation that is kind of like one plus one equals seven. Right. You know, something more complex than either one of them would be alone. So I'm, uh, I'm very interested also in uh, the way the lens functions in relation to the image. Yes. Both the still image, mm -hmm. but in, uh, in the case of the filmic uh, image, uh, the ability to uh, use the lens, and uh, I have a deep interest in both, you know, this thing that I call subjective opticality, mm -hmm. where the lens is used not only as a descriptive device, but as a transformative device. To show us something through the lens uh, that we will never see with the eye. But my thing is, if you can see it with the eye, why don't you just go there and look at it? You know, I mean, really, it's about, it's about transforming that into something you will never see uh, unless you experience this particularly subjective shape work. So uh, that, that really brings me to Stony the Road, because that would and I can talk for hours, so I'm just trying to compress some things because it's almost three o'clock. Are we, are we uh, on the clock here? We're on the clock. Um, um, which but I brings think that's me, what they're here for. You're yeah. here to hear us conversate. Yes, right? I know, I know. But, yes, but, but, but we want... And <laughs> if we don't have time for Q&A, you guys okay with that? You just want to you wanna keep... We can keep chopping it up. Okay, all right. All right. Okay, and that's good. That's good. Because I wanted to bring it to Stony the Road, which is the commission work um, for here in Richmond, because just as you said, if you can go out and see it, you can go out and see it, but there is something that you've created which is quite incredible that you really have no residuals of, of present day. So talk about Stony the Road. We did this over a course of several years, of course, interrupted by COVID. Um, because this was in the making uh, in 2019, but it wasn't mm -hmm. until last year, perhaps, uh, last year that we started, that yeah, you started. Uh, I, I, I first came to that festival in 2019, then it was disrupted mm -hmm. 2020, maybe late 2021 or early time of 2022. Uh, I, I might have come back. Uh, but we walked the trail for the first time uh, in 2019, and you know, whenever I am at a site thinking about making work there, I, I'm seeing the site, but I'm also seeing the site as a photograph. I, I haven't mentioned it, but starting with the Birmingham uh, project, all of the history-based work that I've done had been made in black and white, right. you know, and there's a relationship between the material and the narrative, you know, and black and white is the material of photography's history, but it, it's also the material that uh, is the most immediately transformative because we live in a world of color. Everything is colored, blue, you know, it's color. But to take that out and to shift it to the experience of, you know, you know a materially black and white representation is fundamentally transformative. Right. But for me, it's both transformative materially, but it's also a kind of conceptual shift away from the past to the present on the way to creating this liminal thing that is both 
past, and it must be the present since he made it and we know that he's here now. Mm -hmm. uh, so Stony the Road for me, uh, given how highly charged that site is, and it's probably, of all of the places that I've made work, the kind of, the most narrow in terms of geographic uh, reach and parameter, uh, because so much of what was the trail has now become like downtown Richmond, and, but there's this uninterrupted, undisturbed, almost three mile long piece of the trail that is still visible. And that became my space because going up in there for me, psychically, I was immediately withdrawn from uh, the contemporary moment. And of course, the challenge of making the work is how to keep the viewer in that space and how to use the very narrow but also very present physical and structural geometry of the place if you look at it closely. You know, nature and space has a structure and structure is always the thing that I work with in making the photograph. How to take this space and give it some kind of resonant shape and order so that the photograph resonates and through the photographic object, the history begins to uh, resonate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the trail for me was an interesting challenge because it's very narrow. The James River is here and then you have this trail which would seem to, to shrink the possibilities of what one might make in that space. But, you know, you're always working against those kinds of... Limitations. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, limitations and find, trying to figure out how to open those limitations up. And of course, if you look to the other side of the James River, the world is very present. Yeah. There's a lot of buildings there that suggest where we are right now. So both in the photograph and the film, uh, the most immediate challenge was to not reveal the world as it is, to keep the shape of the photograph and the film mm -hmm. here, not here and oh yeah, there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, it was an interesting challenge too from uh, the filmmaking point, using the steady cam, how to figure out the choreography of the movement through the space without tripping up on that other world that's on the other side. Mm -hmm. How to keep that out of frame and yet make a kind of compelling choreography for the steady cam. As the camera moves through the space, approximating uh, this unknown uh, strange space as if through the eyes of the 350,000 enslaved Africans who, who move through that unknown space uh, on their first encounter uh, with America. So, so in addition to the photograph, Stony the Road, Dawood is referencing the new film, 350,000, which you created as a diptych. So it's not just one particular vantage point. Do you want to talk about the idea of creating the well, this, uh my interest in the multiple image mm -hmm. surfaces earlier in my work, in my Polaroid work from the 90s. Mm -hmm. So this notion that uh, the image or object does not have to be one image is something that's kind of fundamental to my, uh, my making vocabulary as an artist. And with Stony the Road, uh, it's a two-channel piece. Uh, very closely related, but not the same. And I, and I used the two images to create a kind of spatial experience where the viewer can actually walk around or through the trail, mm -hmm. you know, because each time uh, I went to photograph uh, on the trail 
or when we went to film there, some was done this way, some was done that way. So I wanted to keep that sense of uh, that space being a space that actually moves in two directions and to use that both formally and as a narrative uh, device. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very powerful, I will say. I know you have to wait to see it. I'm so sorry, but it is. <laughs> you will be blown away. Um, it is um, this notion about geography and what geography holds in a moment where there is so much uh, focus on erasure, especially of histories. Um, your work really represents an, a, a real profound act of resistance, if you will. And it also forces people to see history or to imagine history almost the way it's been presented in a literary sense. You're bringing in and bridging in the racial imaginary. What uh, is these? To bring that about? racial imaginary to very real history. Right. It's rooted in real history, but we as artists or writers, uh, hopefully, uh, you, you all would be able to uh, get the publication yes. and uh, see the way in which the writers who wrote for the publication, uh, he's probably here, I can't see him, Levon, Levon Brooks, uh, who's one of the writers for the publication mm -hmm. who wrote about the Evergreen Photograph, but wrote an imaginary piece, populating, repopulating, the you know, mm -hmm. that landscape mm -hmm. of Evergreen. So that history is there for those of us mm -hmm. who are engaged in the act of uh, creative expression uh, to work with, you know, as a way to amplify and continue to call attention mm -hmm. uh, to that history. Mm -hmm. You know, much the way uh, one of my idols, Toni Morrison, uh, the writer, in this here place actually comes from uh, a passage uh, in Toni Morrison's Beloved, Beloved mm -hmm. who is another, you know, she's sadly no longer with her, but another writer mm -hmm. who used history and then through a profound act of craft and imagination, reimagined that history. But it's rooted in history, and the work is meant to provoke a conversation uh, about that history. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Beloved, it's also meant to uh, really provoke uh, a memory of the ancestors mm -hmm. who are a part of uh, that history mm -hmm. as well. And I consider all of these uh, history projects, I, I've said it on several occasions, and it's in the, uh, the preface, the dedication that I wrote uh, for the book. But the work is also about ancestor work. That's right. You know, to keep our ancestors present That's right. in a contemporary conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the VMFA, <laughs> or in the Birmingham Museum, yes. or in the Whitney. Or like these conversations can be carried on in these institutional spaces and sites. And uh, I'm, I'm determined that the work, you know, so all of, all of those multiple functions to push the craft forward through the history, to make work the kind of acts as a kind of deterritorialization mm -hmm. of the institutional space in which the work is situated in, mm -hmm. to carry on a conversation with the medium and the field that I'm working inside of, which I'm, I'm always mindful that I'm working inside of this field. Mm -hmm. And all of us are living at a particularly, I, I think we all right now feel it even more urgently, like we're living inside of history. Mm -hmm. We're living right now in a moment of a very profound history that's unfolding and we're all inside of it, mm -hmm. inescapably so. Exactly. so yeah, whatever the question was, that... That, that, that was a good... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good place to end on. Thank you.